everybody. Welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in this world. What's up, Sound Bombing community? This is your friend, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields, and I am always so excited that you are joining me in the bomb shelter because, as always, we bring on some of the most amazing guests around the globe, not only just in the United States, but across the country. And I get the opportunity to sit down with them and ask them questions that many of you all have sent to me or some questions that I might have been thinking of. I am so honored that you decide to join us here today. If you are uh, a new to Sound Bomb and thank you for joining us, you are in the right place at the right time with the right person, with the right bombers and bombing is about healing. And so we want to thank you for joining us today. If you are an old head, OG bomber, we thank you for coming back. And if you listened to us last week, you know that we talked to Allison Pena. And boy, that was a very fruitful conversation. Allison discussed the affluence codes, which are strategies that she created to be able to find wealth, purpose, love, and above all, clarity. And she gave a very, very powerful testimony about growing up very wealthy and then work, you know, hanging out in other communities and saw people were struggling in different areas. And she decided that I want people to understand the affluence code. And it was not, and it's not about just financial wealth, but it's also just about clarity, spiritual clarity, about working uh, with other individuals. And it's also about, you know, just creating your, you know, finding your passion and your purpose. And so shout out to uh, my friend, Allison Pena, who joined us in the bomb shelter. And today is no different. We are going to uh, give you some some more powerful information today. But before we begin, I want to make sure that you are in a safe place, that you are eating those healthy foods that are building up your immune system. You are keeping your hands clean. You are physically distancing yourself. We're not talking social. We're talking physically because by nature, we are social animals and we want to remain social but we want to stay safe. So we want to keep our physical distance. And so again, I want to remind you of doing that. And you all know, it is no secret that modern life can be stressful. There are so many things competing for our attention in this technological age that more and more of us are living in constant state of stimulation. We are on edge forever wired for many of us, Meditation is a beautiful way to find stillness and quiet the mind, but many people find this quite challenging. They can't get past the racing thoughts and fidgeting body. What a lot of people don't realize is that the food you eat plays a huge role in your ability to reach that deep meditative state that your nervous system and brain simply will not allow you to transcend transcend your body when certain nutrients are not present or when you're in what I call a state of nutritional distress. You are what you eat. We know that old cliche that you're no doubt familiar with, but have you ever realized just how profound that notion is and applied it in your own life? As a culture, we tend to generally accept that some foods are good and some are bad for us, but beyond this level of understanding, there is no deeper meaning behind the way we eat. We eat habitually and not intentionally. 
We eat without conscious thought as to what this food is doing within our body beyond the momentary taste and sensation in the mouth. And because of our current situation, many of us are spending more time at home. And that means, yes, more snacking. But the coronavirus disease or COVID-19 outbreak is raising new concerns about our food choices. Well, my next guest, Marlisa Brown, is an expert in the field of food nutrition and food choices. She is a registered dietitian, certified diabetes educator, author, and chef. She has been president of Total Wellness Inc. more than two and a half decades. She has a BS in marketing and MS in nutrition, and she specializes in diabetes, obesity, CVD, and GI disorders, and has worked with over 24,000 patients. Some clients included the New York Jets, Kennedy Space Center, uh, Hofstra and, and Adelphi Universities, Guardian Life, Brookhaven National Labs, Goldman Sachs, Tiffany, Dean Witter Reynolds, Paul Core, Bank of New York, Sony, Liz Claiborne, NASA, the Space Center, and the list goes on and on and on. Marlis has made numerous television appearances, including Defeating Diabetes in Your Kitchen for Foodie TV and five years on International Healthy Cooking for the American Heart Association. She is the author of Gluten-Free, Hassle-Free, the Gluten-Free, Hassle-Free Cookbook, Gluten-Free Training Guide for Restaurants and Chefs. She is the spokes, national spokesperson for the National Association for Diabetes and Care Education Specialist, a professional member of the National Speakers Association, international culinary professional, past president, media rep, and PR chair of the New York City Academy of Nutrition and Diet. Diax, recipient of the 2011 Diabetes Educator of the Year and Emerging Dietic Leader Award for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietics. And you know what, Sound Bombers? She is joining me right now in the bomb shelter. Good morning, Marlissa Brown. How are you? Well, I'm doing great. I better go get whoever that is that you just <laughs> talked about. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Marlissa, we do our research on the amazing folks that are out there in the universe, and you are one of them. I'm so glad that my producers uh, found you because right now you know that we are in an international pandemic. I am a person who loves food. That's why I have to work out. <laughs> That's why I have to run. Even though I am a vegan and have a very strict diet and I tell people just because you go into the health food store doesn't mean that everything is healthy in there for you. So we search high and low to find you, and I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome. Welcome to you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Now, how did you start this journey of your love for food and nutrition? Interesting question. Well, um, when I graduated high school and I was starting college, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. And so my parents had a business, so they encouraged me to take a, to go for a business degree. And while I was in college, I had been working in restaurants and um, as a waitress, and they needed somebody to cover for a wedding that could cook. And I had been like fascinated with cooking. And so the chef that was there mentored me, and I started cooking for um, first time for a major thing um, for a wedding of 200 people. And I got involved in the culinary arts. And then I was interested in nutrition, but I didn't know you could do that for a living. So I started taking all kinds of side classes and doing different things on the side and making healthier foods while I was cooking for weddings and events and, and doing things like that. So while I was in college getting a, a marketing degree, I actually developed um, a culinary career even though I didn't even think that I was going to be doing that for a living. I thought this was just something I was going to do while I was in college. And when I finished college, I found out that there's something called a registered dietitian. And I was like, wow, why didn't I go to college for that? And I found out it was quite involved to go back and do it. So I worked in catering and culinary for several years until I was able to go back to school and then go forward to get my master's in nutrition and then become a registered dietitian. But it was a journey. And I, I there was ups and downs and ins and outs and back and forths and all different kinds of things that happened on the way. Um, but 
it turned out to be something that was a joy and a love and glad so happy that I found it because um, I really, really love what I do. And I think that would be, you know, the best thing for most people if they can find something that they love, they do at least in part, um, you know, as part of every day of their life. And you found your passion at a, at a very young age. What excites you about cooking or preparing food? You know, it's funny, like, you know, <laughs> some people like to read um, like love stories. I like to read cookbooks. Um, I, I don't know. I was interested in, in cooking even when I was little. I didn't know what I was doing. I remember um, I tried to make cookies and I, I did it over and over and over again. Every time I came out, they came out like hockey pucks. I couldn't figure it out. I was a little kid and I went over to my Aunt Gracie's house and she was making these butter cookies and she was mushing the butter with her hands. She had her hands in there and I was like, why are you doing that? And she's like, well, if you don't do that, your cookies are coming out like rocks. And I was like, wow, there's like some sort of science to this. And so I followed Aunt Gracie's lead, and then I became like a fabulous cookie maker. I mean, people wanted to buy my cookies. And so I learned that I loved the food. I loved tasting food. I loved growing food. I loved trying to garden, although I wasn't very successful with a green thumb when I was younger but I loved every piece of it and I don't I don't know why I also love nature and animals and you know everything about the whole just environmental farm to table piece and so it just started to evolve as part of my personality and something that I loved but I didn't even know I loved it I just did it and then as time went on, it was like, wow, I can make these things and people really enjoy them. And when I when I do these things with the recipes, people really like it. And then I made healthier versions of food for people that have health problems and they didn't feel disgusted about eating the foods that were their health foods anymore. Where before, you know, the people were like constantly, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat the other thing. I wasn't even a dietitian yet. And I was able to modify recipes to make it so they could enjoy it. And so the pleasure that I gave other people as well as the joy in preparing the food was all part of the journey. It's interesting to hear you talk about food. My face is just stretching far and wide because I can hear the excitement in in your voice uh, when you talk about preparing healthy foods and when you talk about the feeling that people, other people get. You Have you heard of the concept called flow? Like when you're in your flow and you're sort of in your zone, do you get some type of feeling like that when you're preparing a meal for, let's just say, some clients, some students, or if you're just doing this for your family members? What type of feeling comes over you when you're doing that? I you know, it kind of get excited when I get a new idea. I'm like, oh, well, you know, I could do this this way and it would be different. And, 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 and sometimes I like want to introduce something that somebody says that they may not really be particularly fond of and put it out there and then they eat it. I, I remember the other day I made, um, you'd like this because you were talking about the vegetarian. I used um, a veggie base, um, gluten-free veggie base um, meat type of a product. Um, and I utilized that to make a, a, a red sauce. And my husband was eating it, and he was like, um, and I said, you, you like that, right? It's pretty good. And he's like, yeah. I said, well, it's vegetarian. And he goes, you know, I could have gone happily eating this entire meal without knowing that. Like, yeah, Marlissa, that I love when people I love when people do that because, you know, what's interesting, when you go to events, you know, people now are starting to label their foods. And I remember when I was teaching high school and I made this, this lady some, like, eggplant. She was an older woman and stuck in her ways. And was like, I hate eggplant, Mr. Shields. I hate eggplant. And so I made her this eggplant dish that a friend of mine from Liberia shared with me uh, years ago. And she ate it. And when she ate it, she was like, oh, that was really, really good. And I said, well, Miss Boyles, that was eggplant. Ugh, I did not like that. And it's so funny how our minds right, because they, yeah, they, once sort they of just shift. It is. Yeah, once well, they just... realized what it, what it was. So to hear your husband say, I could have gone oh, yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the same thing with gluten-free. Like, um, you know, I pretty much don't eat gluten and um my brothers you know like they say they only eat things with gluten and i had made something with um a gluten free breading on it and i said this is mine and this is yours so that you could it was the same one for both of us and like yeah yeah you could eat that disgusting stuff over there we'll eat this and they were eating the same thing as me it was just i couldn't tell them because then they wouldn't like if i told them they'd be like oh i knew there was something wrong with it i can't eat this now it is that that is so interesting so i know you are probably super busy having conversations now uh, as i talked about in my introduction because of the covid 19 uh epidemic that's taking place internationally where 
parents are um, they're at home with their children. I, I'm one of those parents uh, who have school age children. And even though we have a pretty healthy diet, um, you know, when you eat too much of anything, it's not it's not good for you. How can you uh, eat healthy when food av availability is really low right now? What strategies do you have for those individuals? So, so there's a couple of layers to this, and and depending on where somebody is in the country, of course, would make the difference on what is available. Because certain places there's a lot more. Like I'm in New York, and you know sometimes we go to the supermarket, and it's like they covered the certain sections with just sheets. There was nothing there at all. And in some other places that I've spoken to patients that like are remote right now, they had plenty of availability. So there's two different things that we have to consider here. Availability is one being stuck in the house and having total access <laughs> to going back and forth and possibly not working or being on a schedule to giving you like this boredom feeling to going back and forth past the food areas and food pantries. That's a separate issue. Having any kind of a schedule at all in your eating pattern because of that, if you're not working, if you're working remotely, it's different. But if you're not working, you may not be on any schedule, sleeping different hours, um, you know, being awake or, or activity wise, different hours, not exercising as much. There's so many levels that affect that your intake. So let me talk about the most important things that I, I can see. So first off, if you have limited access, let's say to variety of food, you want to try to find interesting ways to utilize the food that you have and to have it available to you so that you'll be able to get it quickly and easily. So um, let's say, for example, um, we'll do for the meat eaters. Let's say you could get chicken, okay, and you got lots of chicken. I mean, and you grilled up, I don't know, 10 pounds of chicken because you were able to get um, chicken for it. You would want to make something different with the chicken that you pre-grilled, but have it available to you. So you might make a chicken salad. You might have chicken over a salad. You might slice up chicken and put it in a soup. You might take that and, and saute it with some, you know, even though it was already cooked with some broccoli and garlic and onions. Like you want to make uses of a food that you have in many different ways. So like, let's say you are um, vegetarian and you had um, beans in your house. Now I find that the dry beans were much more available than the canned beans. Um, in the stores. And a lot of people never had made the fresh beans before. They're always buying like the canned beans. Meanwhile, you buy one bag of beans, which is like $3. And if you're not working, it's nice to know that you can buy something that's inexpensive. One bag of beans for like $3 would make you like, you know, 15 cans worth of cook you know canned beans and so you know just um looking up the skills so if you don't know how to do it yourself and you don't have somebody to help you there are uh, numerous recipes for beans online so i might do chickpeas with garlic and onion and i might have some beans in a soup and i might make a dip out of beans and have that with some veggie chips and i, I mean i might make a chili um with the beans and then i might make um a, or a stew with the beans and then you only need a little bit of meat if you're going to do meat in a stew, um, if that's what you choose, because of the fact that um, the beans um, give you the um, the bulk and the filler of the um, entire stew. So there's there's a lot of ways to be interesting um, instead of being redundant and, and boring and over and over again with the same food. So that's like as far as like availability, as far as um, eating in a better way, you want to have some sort of a schedule for your day, some sort of a schedule. It doesn't have to be like a work schedule, but some sort of a schedule so you can space your eating. You want to space your eating so that this way it's not like you wait until you're so hungry that you go in the refrigerator and you eat a pound of cheese while you're trying to figure out what to eat or you eat a giant um, bowl of chips or something like that because that's what you found in the cabinet. Um, I'd like to address something I call um, primal programming. It's, it's, it's part of my own concept mixed with um, science together. And primal programming, there are things that we do that are part of our survival internal subconscious piece of our bodies. And certain things like, so for example, um, we would tend toward having more salt when we can get it because salt naturally isn't usually available in the environment so the genetic predisposition to want to eat more salt is ingrained in our primal programming we would be um, primarily programmed to maybe go for high carbohydrate foods because of that part of survival would be when food is available the higher calorie foods are the things that you'd want to get into your body so your body could store when you're under stress your primal programming kind of gets triggered 
and the the desire to eat higher calorie foods and the desire to take in more sodium and the desire to eat as much as available for storage is sort of like that programming like hey you know when food's not available I need to have it it's the same kind of thing when you're stressed and so people will eat more because you may not even realize you're stressed but this what's going on in the world today this uncertainty the danger the fear these are all triggers for our underlying primal instincts so that's something i'd like to you know just touch on now there are some ways that we can sort of hack our brain to replace those things that are being that we are craving for what are, what are some ways that we can actually do that so let's just say you're craving because i know when there's certain things that you're craving like when when women are pregnant there's certain things that they're craving the sense that and what the doctors have said that, that they're missing something else so they look for it here what are some what are some ways that we can sort of hack our brains instead of just saying reaching for the salt, re replacing with something else? So let's do a brain hack. So let's say I want um, something salty and I was going to go for like, you know, the cheese, um, let's say cheddar cheese popcorn. Let's say that's the salty thing I was going to go for. So instead of doing that, OK, let's say I took some plain air popped popcorn and I threw a handful of goldfish in it. And I mix it all together in a bowl. So when I'm sitting there, I have a bowl of air popped plain popcorn with no flavoring on it. But there are goldfish in there. And the goldfish, as you know, are like salty, crunchy, cheesy things. And so every handful of popcorn, I get like one or two pieces of goldfish that salt make the whole thing taste saltier. Or it could have been chocolate. Let's say I wanted something sweet. I'm, I'm picking on popcorn first because it just I'm there. But it could have been something else. So let's say we had the air popped popcorn. And um, I threw in a handful, like, you know, maybe like 15 chocolate chips and I melted the chocolate into the popcorn and I let that cool for a little bit. Every handful is going to be like sweet with that popcorn, but I'm not eating a whole piece of chocolate cake or I'm not eating a whole bowl full of goldfish. I'm only eating a few. So you take a food and this is something I use as I call it my dilution, the dilution factor. I'm actually writing a book on that. And the dilution factor is, is you take something that gives you the joy of what you want and you dilute it with something else that's still enjoyable, but it makes you feel like you're getting that whole sensation at the same time. So it's, it's like, you're not leaving something out. You're having it, but you're not having it in quantity. When I was, um, when I was studying at the culinary Institute, um, they were talking about, you know, getting the most flavorful food and then adding a small amount of it to something to make it feel like you're having it all. And, and one of the things they had is they had a salad and you know how, Sometimes when people get a salad, they get, let's say it was blue cheese on the salad. The whole salad's got like, you know, half a cup of blue cheese on it. So instead what they did was they got like a really highly flavored piece of blue cheese and they melted it on a, a big crouton, a garlic crouton. And they put that on the top in the middle of the salad. And then when you ate the salad, you broke up the crouton and little pieces of highly flavored um, crouton and blue cheese got all over your salad. Okay. But and it was very flavorful. It wasn't like you bought the fat-free one that you had to use twice as much to get flavor. It was very flavorful. And you felt like you were having blue cheese all over your salad. But really, you only had the equivalent of maybe like two teaspoons worth as opposed to like a half a cup worth on your salad. And so the concept and, – and that's – theirs is not the dilution factor. Theirs is bringing in the flavor. Mine is, is like you dilute the foods that you really want that are higher in calories, higher in fat, higher in salt with healthier foods that are part of that meal. So um, let's say, um, and I'm not labeling things good or bad, but let's say we know that if we ate a giant plate of pasta, it would be fattening because there'd be so much pasta on the plate. Um, usually let's say a big plate of pasta would be like three cups of pasta, which would be count about like nine pieces of bread, which would be like a half a loaf of bread. And we all know you're not supposed to eat a half a loaf of bread one time. So let's say instead of putting three cups of pasta, I put like a cup of pasta with two cups of broccoli with let's say, um, and then some sort of a protein, whether it was some beans or whether it was some chicken or whether it was some shrimp in with that. And now I have this giant plate and it has sauce and it has, you know, vegetables and it has pasta and it has some protein, but it's not all pasta. And so therefore, I'm not having nine pieces of bread. I might be having the equivalent of two or three pieces of bread, plus my vegetables, plus my protein. But the whole plate looks like pasta. And so it's a dilution factor. Good. And that's the way. Good recommendations. I, I, I like that. I felt I felt kind of 
um, bad when you said three cups of pasta is like eating a half loaf of bread. I'm like, oh, is she looking? Are you spying in my kitchen? <laughs> I'm just, you know what? In, in, in two and a half decades of talking with people, I can tell you that people are, uh, even though they're different, they have a lot of similarities in, in things that they do. Yeah. Um, um, like, for example, and I was telling somebody this on another show the other day is, you know, when people keep a journal, like when I ask them to write down what they eat for a few days, just so I get a good feeling because nobody ever remembers things properly, they forget. So um, I ask them to write it down. So when somebody has chicken, if it's fried, they never write the word fried. But if it's grilled, they always write the word grilled. Always. And why is that? So, because they don't want to admit that they, it, the, it, the, to, to the fry is the negative no, they don't yeah. want to. They don't want to put it out there. They eat the chicken. They know it was fried. They don't want to say <laughs> that, that they eat fried chicken. But it's always that. It's always, always. I'm saying I've those twenty four thousand people. I've, everybody <laughs> does that. It's 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 across the board. So so I know that there are human pieces about human nature, and even though we're different, there are certain things that are similar. And so um, you know, it's it's like my one more jelly bean thing. I was talking to somebody. I have this thing. It's called one more jelly bean. And what it is is that, like, let's say you like jelly beans, and um, you know, whenever you're feeling bad, you pop a couple of jelly beans, and it made you feel a little better because you really like jelly beans. But what happens is, if you're under stress, okay, and there's jelly beans in your house, your brain says jelly beans make me feel better. Let me have some jelly beans, and so you start eating them. And but you don't feel better because you're not stressed because of the jelly beans. This is a little bit more than just let me just have a little something that I like. And so you keep eating them because you're not feeling better yet. I mean, the reason you're not feeling better, even though you like the jelly beans, is because whatever's wrong is still wrong. And so you eat more and more jelly beans. You're actually getting sick from eating the jelly beans. But your brain tells you jelly beans make me feel better. So I probably didn't eat enough yet because I still don't feel better and you <laughs> eat them to nausea. And so, so it's, it's, it's part of what we try, our brains try to remember what it was that helps us in certain situations, except the problem is, is sometimes the things that are stored aren't the things that are going to help us. And that's why when you're in a situation like the coronavirus, when we're we're afraid and we're nervous and we're financially worried, we're worried about our health, we're worried about family members' health, we, we're missing the social interaction, we're missing our usual activities. Under the state of stress, our brains are going to go to the things that we usually have to just give us a little burst that's not going to take care of it. And so adding healthier foods and things that are going to make us stronger will make us better equipped to be able to improve our immune system and improve our functionality during this period. So let's park right there. What are, what are some things people should eat to help their energy and to build their immune system up? There, there are some things I constantly recommend in my own life where I take these herb, these uh, liquid herbs to sort of build my immune system up. My children, I take it. It's a mixture of echinacea and golden seal and things of that nature. And then we also do like a sea moss that sort of builds our immune system up. We drink a lot of water. We drink warm water and lemon. Uh, what are some things that, that, that you could recommend to individuals to, to help build their energy and build a stronger immune system? Okay, definitely. And I just want to mention before I go forward is, is that, you know, I try to work within people as an individual approach because some people have pre-existing health problems or taking certain sort of supplements and, and such may interact with medications. So certainly if you're on medications or if somebody has a health problem, um, even something like a, um, an issue where they're on some sort of a restriction, like let's say they're on a fluid restriction because of congestive heart failure, because of kidney failure, the recommendations that, you know, that I give are not broad scale for everybody because we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily talking right to the person person and asking them their health history. A lot of times people take for granted and don't realize that this, you know, even with safe, generally safe, natural things may not necessarily be safe and good for them. So Melissa, I just always say I am that. I'm so glad that you said that. And I, I just, I just share what my family takes, but I'm so glad that you stated that because one of my concerns is so many people are recommending so much stuff and they don't realize that each one of us have a different body type. And so these individuals go out and they take these supplements or whatever they are and they say, oh, it didn't work for me. And the person will work for me. Well, our body, our bodies are very, very different. And that's a big concern for me. Some of the most unhealthy people that I know, Marlissa, it is, is recommending 
things and their bodies, they're not even that healthy. So let's say you say, I'll, make, I'll recommend this, but I look at your eating habits. I look at your movement habits and then you're recommending these individuals and you don't even do those things. So I'm so glad that you sort of step back because as a person who's been on national, international TV, who's written books, you do as an individual who has a brand, you want to be mindful of what I'm recommending individuals because people ask me all the time. So what do you take? I said, well, this is what I take. This is I know my body type. I know my body. I know my children. I know what they can and can't take. And so I'm mindful of that. So I I, I suggest things, but I'm like, well, but you still need to check with your doctor, uh, your you know, if you have a homeopathic doctor, naturopath or an MD or DO. But you have to be mindful of your body. And many of us don't know our body. So I want to thank you for saying that before you lead into some of the recommendations. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, because I had somebody, um, I mean, just one example. I mean, this person, she was on a blood pressure medication that made her potassium go up. And she had leg cramps, but not because her potassium was low, but because it was partially high. And then she went out and she was taking a multivitamin that had that in it. And then she was taking the extra vitamin by itself that had it in it. And then she was drinking alkaline water that had it in it. And she got her potassium levels up to dangerous, almost a heart attack level. And she didn't realize, you know, that she was doing all these things. She thought it was all natural and safe. She was drinking this extra alkaline water. She was taking this multivitamin had the potassium in it she was taking another vitamin the potassium and it was too much potassium it was dangerous so so you know sometimes you need it and sometimes you don't and and that's that's why we excellent point on your place so let me talk about some things that are generally okay so obviously given people don't have things in their house so um you need need to find what's available so if you have you don't have fresh fruit you might have frozen fruit like or berries you may have dried fruit you you know there's ways of finding things that are not maybe fruit in its own juice i'm using fruit first as an example there's way of finding things in different avenues if it's not the usual lane that you go to so if you usually go to the frozen vegetable aisle in the supermarket to pick up your produce and there's nothing in the frozen vegetable cases we can use fresh. I've been noticing that the supermarkets do have fresh produce, but if you don't know how to prepare it, there's simple ways to do it. And and that's important for people to understand. They shouldn't be afraid of trying things in a different way because of that. It's, it's really not as hard as you think it is. So fruits and vegetables clearly should be increased in most people's diets. Different colors. Don't just eat broccoli a thousand times. Um, different colors have different antioxidant and you know, benefits. and you know what we do in our house, Marlissa is, and I saw this body of research around this. We keep fruit on our kitchen table, and so my children are constantly walking past, and so they grab what's the most accessible to them. I, I did an experiment with my children with with food in the refrigerator, and I put some of the food all the way in the back. And they wouldn't grab those foods because they were so far in the back. But when I moved them up to the front, then they would they would grab them. And it's interesting because we're only talking about moving your arm, Marlissa, like three or four inches further. But because they don't see it, it's like when you're stepping out of a when you're going to the grocery store and they put those things in the aisle right where you're at your shopping cart. And you're there with let's just say that you're my mom we're in a grocery store and you and I are standing in that line. And I look over and I'm like, oh, I see a Snickers. Oh, I see that because it's right there and I'm standing there and I'm observing those things. So the fruit, I think, is really, really good. And I want to encourage you all to have them in places that they're accessible. Just like now we have places that are accessible where my kids walk in the house and they wash their hands with hand sanitizer, which is very accessible. The fruit, the fruit bars, the dry right there is, is something that you can actually do. And I want to encourage people to do that because, again, we also know that there's a financial curve and a learning curve with, when it when it talks about education and people who, who, who don't have access to healthy foods and, and understand this. You're giving some very, very basic, basic stuff. So continue for us, please. And interesting, you know, when you said when it's right on the counter, it's like, what do you see when you first walk into most supermarkets? The first thing is the cake. The cake. You know? so right. It's right there. I mean, that's what you see, right? You come in there and, and most people like, unfortunately, shop hungry. So you walk into the supermarket hungry right into the cake aisle. And it's like, ooh, look at those. You know, and you know, and you don't usually and people say, well, I bought this for my husband. or I bought this. But usually most people pick the thing that they like the most when they're in they're shopping. It's not necessarily like so if you happen to like, you know, a vanilla covered chocolate cake and you walk into the supermarket and there's that and coffee cake, you're picking up the vanilla covered <laughs> chocolate cake. It's just 
Um, and they did a study, by the way, about what you did at your house, um, where they had it in a corporate environment where they had bowls of candy and they put the bowls of candy where somebody from their desk without getting up could reach and get the candy. And then they moved the candy like I think it was just a few inches so that you had to actually stand up to get the candy. And I think when you could reach, I don't remember the exact statistics because I don't have it in front of you, but when you could reach and grab it without standing up, which was just standing up for a second to grab it, they think they ate two and a half times as much candy just because it was that cold. and it was only talking about a six inch difference here you know but they had to stand to get it as opposed to just reach across and get it so interesting point um so okay so back to um so back to eating in the house and again like by the way we sang fruit you know if somebody di has diabetes they can't have unlimited fruit so you know like that was back to the point when we were talking about different health problems they can have fruit but it has to meet the carbohydrate needs of their particular diet in conjunction with their um, medication so um, so we, we do want different colors and in, in the fruits and vegetables because of the antioxidant and immune um, stimulating benefits of those things. We do want to drink a lot of water. And interesting, you said lemon. You said lemon in the water. Yes. Is that what yes, you Yes, I did. I, yeah. yeah. So lemon, you know, because they talk about, you know, the benefits sometimes for, um, you know, for cleansing and for your liver and things like that. But plain water, fine. Some people said they can't drink plain water. So then we try to put a little something in it that gives them a little bit of flavor, even if it's only like, you know, even if it's like a quarter of a cup of some sort of a, a fruit juice, even though I don't encourage a lot of juice, if they need something to get the water in, because there's nothing more important to your body than water because we're mostly made of water and your lungs are mucous membrane and they require water. And the only thing that your lungs do is they breathe in and they breathe out and they, this oxygen and such gets transported through your body from your heart that pumps. And we know that the heart and the lungs functioning are two of the most important things that take place in our bodies. And so if by drinking more water, it makes it easier for our lungs to function and our blood is less um, thick and gooey and sticky when we're drinking enough fluids, easier for your heart to pump. We're making the two systems that are the most negatively affected by this virus function more effectively just by providing water. So water is available. I mean, some people were freaking out because they couldn't get bottled water. I was like, okay, but we do have a faucet. We could use that water. No, I don't like to drink that water, but it is water. And if this is the water that's available to you, okay, you do have that. It's not like you don't have food. You know, so food is something that you have to have, that you have to get. You have the sinks and you have the faucets and you have water. Um, if it really bothers you, boil it. You know what I'm saying? But we have water. So um, people are very much so encouraged to drink water, especially elderly people who are really affected, um, you know, the worst by this virus because – what I have found with working with older people through the years is that they don't drink enough fluids most of the time. And I'll have a conversation. I'll go, well, I drink water. And I'll say, okay, how much water do you drink? Well, I take it when I have my pills. So, so you had one glass of water twice a day? No, no, I use the same glass later. You know, <laughs> drink it. In the morning, they had the leftovers. They have a glass or they have a glass and a half. Or and I'm like, so your blood must be like a uh, silly putty because, you know, you, you need, your, your blood is made of water. I mean, if you don't drink water, where do you think your blood gets it from? So, so, so that's an easy thing to do, which isn't require a lot of, you know, complications. And, and if you don't find that you're normally doing it, you need to force the habit a couple of days just to get in the habit. And they'll say, well, I'm not thirsty. And once you get older, the antidiuretic hormone, which, which like triggers you to drink that lets you know that you're thirsty, um, doesn't work as well. And if you waited until you're thirsty to drink, you're already dehydrated. So if you actually pushed yourself to drink more fluids on a regular basis, especially water, you would become more thirsty because your antidiuretic hormone that you have would become more effective. And only people that are on fluid restrictions, such as people that have um, kidney disease and congestive heart failure and such like that, should not be just drinking freely without a recommendation, but other people need to drink. I'm not saying drink a gallon and a half of water. I mean, you know, um, you know, if it was a 16 ounce bottle, I mean, four to six, 16 ounce bottles or, you know, eight to 10 or 11 glasses is usually more than adequate for mostly everybody, unless of course there's a restriction or a need for additional. So that would be my, my first recommendation with don't eat the same fruits and vegetables over and over and over again, unless that's the only thing that's available. 
And if you don't know how to cook a vegetable, you know, you could do something simple. I mean, if you have a vegetable, <laughs> like you, you have it, there it is. It's a vegetable. Oh, my God, it's fresh. I don't know what to do with it. Okay. So cut off the hard parts or, or peel off the hard parts. Like, so if you look at something like broccoli, the stem might be really hard or something like asparagus, you can break off the end. Break, take off the hard parts, cut it up, put it in a microwavable safe thing, rinse it off, put a tiny, you know, just a little drizzle of, like, say, olive oil on it. Uh, maybe a little seasoning, Mrs. Dash, a touch of salt, a little garlic and onion, whatever you prefer. Cover it with plastic and like nuke it in the microwave for like eight minutes if they don't know how to cook. I mean, at least they'd have a cooked vegetable. Mm -hmm. And um, you can put it in the refrigerator. You could do it all at one time and put it in the refrigerator and take a little bit out at a time. Throw it in the soup, throw it in a salad, um, you know, have it on the side, you know. So we, we don't have to be, um, you know, Boring. I, I remember I, I grew a lot of peppers a few years ago, and um, one of my Hispanic patients said to me, "You could just put them in a Ziploc in the freezer." And I'm good at remembering how to do things, but do things. But I didn't get that. She was, "Oh yeah, yeah, we put our peppers in the freezer all the time." And I was like, "Really?" And she's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, great idea." So I did. I took it. I put it in the freezer in a Ziploc. And you know what? Those peppers. Whenever I needed peppers, there they were, sautéed, you know, roasted. <laughs> they just pulled them right out of the freezer. I didn't even have to do anything. I just put them in a freezer bag. Somebody else that had this recommendation that she had gotten from her family is something that they usually did that wasn't as part of something that we did in my family that gave me an idea that made it possible for me to have peppers whenever I wanted peppers. So I want to I want to jump outside of our homes now because many of the states are opening. Georgia is opening. Florida is opening and parts of California is opening. Um, I want to talk about eating outside of the house now. So I have have two questions. One is, can coronavirus spread through food? And then the other one is, is it safe to eat at restaurants during the coronavirus outbreak? Well, um, interesting questions, because I think some of the information isn't 100 percent certain. But um, one of the things that I would like to, to say is that if it's a very tightly packed um, restaurant where there's not a lot of space in between people, I'd prefer that people take that food to go um, because of the fact that we don't know, you know, how prevalent the virus might still be in an area and it's hard to socially distance if you're on top of other people. So in situations where they might have picnic tables outside or they might have a way that you can take it with you, even though restaurants have been open to go in very small spaces, I would suggest to go at least why the virus is still widely available. You know, it's not like just limited in, in smaller numbers. Uh, if you could, if it's a restaurant, like hopefully the tables aren't on top of each other. Um, you know, if you want, you can bring something to wipe down the table if you don't, you know, like the table part itself, because that's where if somebody was leaning or something and it wasn't disinfected, um, a cloth wipe, you can wipe down the area where you're going to be eating, where you're going to be putting your fork and knife, where you're going to be putting your hands. Don't put your hand, you know, make sure the restaurant looks like they're doing cleaning in between clients on the tables like you know sometimes certain places are better than others we've already been in the place where they quick clean off the table and it's like a one two three wipe and there's still like fragments of like breadcrumbs and things on the table you want to see if a restaurant is doing a good job at um, cleaning the areas between customers cooking the food they feel is fairly safe um, as far as eating the foods. So if the food handlers are um, using gloves in the kitchen and cooking the food and then not handling it with their own hands and putting it on clean, you know, disinfected plates and bringing out the food probably is fine. It's more of a question of the, um, the way it's being cleaned, the areas are being cleaned in between people. Um, same thing with the restrooms. Like if you're going to go to the restroom and they have the restroom handles where you have to pull on the handle to open it and pull on a handle to leave, use a paper towel or something to use the handle. So that this way you don't go to the restroom, wash your hands for 20 seconds and then walk out and grab a handle that everybody else handled. And then somebody that might have had the virus might have touched the handle and you don't know that. So try to you know, be a little bit cleaner, you know, just in the way that you do things. Don't be neurotic. It's OK to go out. Um, just make sure you're going to places that look like they're trying to be careful and you try to be careful as well. And the cooking of the food should be fine. You know, it's interesting. I've, I'm a, like a Whole Foods and Trader Joe's junkie. I, as I travel, I'm always in a Whole Foods. And I'm observing just not, not only just Whole Foods, but just other stores across the country, how they're handling this pandemic. And what's interesting, Melissa, is a lot of the stuff that's happening right now 
we should have been doing a long time of go expose food in the environment grabbing donuts single donuts and single cookies and i i'm a victim of doing the exact same thing but again you get so relaxed and you get so used to doing certain things it shouldn't have taken this pandemic for individuals who've been in the food industry for years who should have said hey we need to pack up these these single cookies we need to pack up these single donuts these single breads and bagels and put them into and to seal them because i'm really more appreciative now than ever and after this we can't go back to the business as usual and i'm glad because we have to protect ourselves our environment the foods is going into our bodies because again we know that the majority of the diseases that are affecting us are are coming from foods of course things that we inherited from family members or ancestors but i'm talking about the foods that we take in our bodies and so i think that i'm seeing a lot of the restaurants and a lot of the stores being very very proactive when it comes to food prep and covering food and things things of that nature you know, and it's funny, you know, sometimes we you know, in area, we'll try to do something, you know, through the years, we try to do something to make it better for the environment and for health. And then sometimes it backfires. Like, so in, in Suffolk County, um, where I live and in Nassau County, they put a law in effect where, um, you know, you had to pay. They didn't have plastic bags anymore. You had to pay if you wanted a bag. And most people were encouraged to bring recyclable bags. And they only did that like a few, like very short period of time ago. It's, it hasn't been like years recent. And what happened was, is then now all of a sudden they were saying, don't bring your recyclable bags because it could be, you know, it could be carrying, bring the coronavirus in and putting on, nobody wants to touch the recyclables. But now we don't have the bags here because they took them out <laughs> because they took them out to be like environmentally, you know, less plastic and things. But now we don't have the plastic bags. So they have these really cheap um, paper bags in the supermarkets that you pay five cents each for, but you can't put more than five things in them because otherwise the bag will rip. So now people are not going in with the recyclable bags and taking 10 times as many paper bags because it's all gone. And they're throwing those bags out the minute they get home because of that. They said that people are touching them. They're afraid of the virus. So we're actually throwing out more trees. You know, and we're not, it's, it's sort of like a backfire. So sometimes we don't really absolutely know what we're doing when we make a change. Um, and certainly we don't want people to be afraid. I mean, living in fear, I mean, fear could be positive and negative. Some people say it's only bad. No, it's not because a little bit of fear makes you more careful. I mean, I remember we were doing a health fair at one big event at a corporation and it was a giant salad and had different kinds of, um, the vendor had different kinds of cheese and things like in it. And he was portioning it out with his gloves gloves on and everything and you know tongue so nothing was being touched and some customer that was eating the salad says wow this is delicious and she took her fork and stuck it right in the giant salad thing that he had mm. <laughs> and he and he looks at me after she walked away he goes now i gotta throw this whole thing out uh. okay but some people may not have you see and that's the po point that you're making like there are some people that say well you know I just made this whole, I'm not throwing it out, it cost me money. And so there, I'm not saying restaurants do that. I'm saying that in general, the idea of cross-contamination and, and care and such isn't always taken quite as strongly by some than others. And that's always going to be the case. And so we have some people that are at one spectrum that are totally terrified of everything and other people that will do whatever they want. And if people could just pivot a little bit more toward the middle, we'd be safer overall. Wow. So you have just a wealth of information and of course I can't keep you forever and which I would love to continue the conversation because I am taking notes myself, but I want my listeners to continue the conversation with you. How can our listeners reach out to you? If they have questions about what you're doing, food, nutrition, want to pick up a copy of your book, want to invite you onto their show, want to invite you to speak eventually once we are able to leave our houses, how can they do that? Okay, so I'm very Googleable, and Marlisa isn't a very common name. So Marlisa Brown, if you Google me, I get lots of pages. If you go on Amazon, um, Marlisa Brown, um, some of my books, the gluten-free books. I wrote a book, Get It the F Together, about fitness, family, fun, and finance. Um, different books will come up. If you um, go on Instagram, it's Marlisa Brown with the number eight. If you go on LinkedIn, Marlisa Brown. If you go on YouTube, Marlisa's, I think I'm – Marlisa's one, it says there. I have a website, twellness.net, about my office, marlisaspeaks.com, about speaking, gluten free, easy with an easy um, for the gluten and food allergies. Um, you can find me pretty much 
almost everywhere. Um, happy. I'm, I'm a mummy. I'm a mummy because I have so much to say, and I want to wrap it up pretty cool um, and smooth. So just put my name in or go to twellness.net or malisaspeaks.com or go to any of those social media platforms, Dieting Dietitian under Facebook, and I'll be happy to um, reach out and provide more information when anybody ever needs it. All right. I have another question that's just hit me. So, Marlissa, as we know, as before this pandemic um, became exposed, we we know in the food industry that there's something called food deserts in particularly minority communities, you know, in particular black and brown communities or, or just people who are just poor. As you think about food deserts and now you have this pandemic, what are some of your concerns about individuals who just aren't educated enough about the value of food and having access to healthy foods during this time? So, I mean, you want to keep it simple, okay, especially whether it's educational or, you know, financial, you know, or even just limited in the environment. So, if we could, um, you know, there's, there's different community centers and such in different areas. I would encourage the um, different centers um, or whether it's at a church where they have a food pantry to put out um, information, simple tips, you know, about including more vegetables and fruits, um, about easy ways to cook beans, about, you know, different ways of utilizing um, less popular cuts of meat. Like somebody, like if they're eating, let's say, um, about veggie burgers, if somebody wants to be a vegetarian, or why didn't choose if somebody's a complete vegetarian about including higher protein sources of vegetarian foods. You want to provide information that's simple. You want to keep it simple. So, I would put tips on how to make um, different kinds of beans, um, benefits of different kinds of vegetables, easy cooking methods of these items, and I would pick the least expensive items. So, for example, um, I'm not going to encourage somebody to buy an expensive cut, um, a expensive piece of fish if it's a poor area, but I might be able to tell them if I want them to have more fish, a less expensive what, you know, like so, for example, if let's say um, it's very expensive to buy tuna, you know, and let's say in the area, let's say in Florida, they have a lot of grouper, I might say, well, here's some cool ways of making um, grouper, you know, so that I could encourage things that are available and not as expensive or or point people to places where they can get um, more food options. There are, are pantries and in, in areas where if you're income compromised, where there's more food available, but a lot of times people don't know where those are. So that would be an information sheet, community awareness, community awareness programs, information at the schools, any place that you can provide it, information that you give to children to take home to share with their parents. Make sure that if it's an area that's culturally to a certain language that it's written in that language. Like certainly if um, I only speak English and everybody is a Hispanic at home, the children might not um might not, you know, translate it well enough to the parents for them to get it. So have somebody that speaks Spanish in that particular dialect of Spanish speaking to translate it and put that handout and that materials for the child to bring home for the parents. Good information. So, all right, this is the, my favorite part of the show and it's called the super bomb questions. And it's a variety of questions I want you to answer as quickly as possible. All right. Are you ready? <laughs> I don't know. All, all right. right. I think you are ready. So here we go. What is your favorite word? I don't know if I have a favorite word. Um, happiness. <laughs> What's your favorite quote or spiritual verse that you love? I like to say what my grandmother would always say is healthy, happy. What's your superpower? My superpower. Um, my superpower. <sighs> to dream. What's your spirit animal? I love my dog. <laughs> <laughs> what moves you to tears of joy? Old movies. What moves you to tears of sorrow? Old movies. <laughs> <laughs> what do you wish you had more time to do? Everything. <laughs> what is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? Hmm. My house. What dead person would you most like to meet or get advice from? Oh, that's too difficult to answer. That's too difficult to answer. I can't answer that. If you were in the Mrs. America talent competition, what would your talent be? I could sing. <laughs> All right, Marlissa Brown, we want to thank you for joining me in the bomb shelter. You have been a pleasure to talk with. 
Thank you. It was fun. I liked it too. And I also want to thank my engineer, Alec Blanc, my producer, Kimberly Peterson, Supremacy for our theme music, and all of you for listening. Make sure you subscribe, leave a comment, and stop being stingy and share me with all of your friends. If you want more, want to know more about me, you can visit my site, drlds.com. That's drlds.com. And as always, believe that something wonderful is about to happen and that some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mess. Thanks for tuning in and do something for someone other than yourself today. Eat healthy foods. Eat healthy foods. You've been listening to Sound Bombing. Peace.